Welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. We're going to continue our playthrough of Bloodborne, the board game. We're in chapter number two. If you haven't checked out all my previous videos in this showcase, a link will show up in the top right hand corner so you can get yourself caught up to where we currently are. If you remember at the very end of the last video, I was mulling over whether I could use the hand lantern or not. Now the reason using the hand lantern right now would make a lot of sense is because I could teleport to another lantern getting me out of this space and avoiding me from taking what I know is going to be coming a special attack from this enemy which is up there in the top right hand corner in red a really nasty one that will do four damage to me. Now the one thing I want to mention is I went and looked inside the rule book around fog gates and it makes it seem based on those rules that once you're inside those fog gates you cannot get out of them without going to the hunter's dream that's the only place you can go. But then there is the teleport keyword at the very back of the book that doesn't necessarily say it circumvents the fog gates, but it kind of makes it seem like you potentially could teleport. But again, it's not clear. So what do you do in these situations where the FAQ as well as the FAQ form on Board Game Geek don't have the answers? Well, there's a general rule inside this board game that basically says, you know, nastiness is going to prevail. There's a, that's not actually the wording, but that's really what's going to happen here. It's Bloodborne. You're going to take the worst path possible in these situations. So I'm going to go ahead and stay put, which is going to mean that I'm going to have an incoming attack coming from this Huntsman's Minion, which is going to do four damage towards me. Last card in the enemy action deck is the special, which will trigger that nasty ability on the card. And that's the ability at the very top here, which is a slow attack for four damage, and it blocks two from the hunter's attack, cannot be staggered. And as of right now, I have no cards. I'm at the end of my turn. I'd burn a ton of cards to try and put as much damage on this thing as possible. Did a pretty good job of getting the first five on there and then two additional, but didn't have enough to really finish it off. So I'm going to be losing four health down from six right now. All right, so that was a pretty solid hit, and now we're done with the monster activations. Nothing else is uh, around that's going to activate within one tile. Again, if there was monsters there to the left, they would activate, and they'd move as close to the fog gate, and they would stop right there. They don't enter into the fog gate area. As we're quite aware with, with a brand new round, we're going to go ahead and uptick the hunt track by one. I really want to focus this turn on trying to take out that huntsman's minion before it takes me out. As you can see on the left hand side, the enemy action deck has been all shuffled up and reset. I've also done the same with my hunter deck, plus we need to draw three cards up for this turn. I got invigorating, which has a dodge, a heal one, clearing this slot or any other slot, a basic stagger and a basic dodge. Now what's kind of nice about this setup is the fact that I do have a heal in there. What's nasty is that every single attack from this Huntsman minion that I could throw at me is literally three damage or above, which puts me in a pretty tough space. But I still have a trick up my sleeve and I believe what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch my trick weapon to its opposite side, wiping out everything that I have here. So I'm going to go ahead and discard one of the basic dodges I have. Go ahead and switched over my trick weapon here. You'll see attacks with stagger also deal plus one damage, which is one of the reasons why I'm placing the bloodstone shard this time in a different slot. I'm going to place it in a quick cut slot in the middle because I know I have a stagger card I can use on the attack to go up against this thing, which I can place in the slash or I should say the third slot, which is a medium speed. It's two damage, but if I place a stagger card in there, now I've got three damage, which is what I need to take this thing out. Plus I have that dodge in my back pocket. It's also worth noting that you'll see on the far right hand side, I had that rune card that used to be on the opposite side of the trick weapon. That was a one time use one that gets exhausted, which is flipped over until I go back to the hunter's dream. Then it becomes reactivated again. I can use it. But as of right now, that bloodstone shard, I can keep using that over and over and over again. As the card specifically states, every single time I transform my weapon, I can just choose another slot. This is a really awesome card. Let's find out what the enemy action deck has for us. A basic attack. Okay, well, this is good. This actually works out really nicely because it's a slow attack for three damage. And when we're resolving things here again, I could choose to burn my card right now to dodge this. But why would I? Because I've set myself up in a situation where my slash is going to do two damage at a medium speed, which will resolve first. Plus, I get an additional damage because I'm using my saw cleaver. So things worked out pretty good for me. Two damage here, and of course the stagger don't even need it because this thing's going to be taken out before it even has a chance to go ahead and do its basic with the plus one that I get from the ability on the trick weapon. Three damage, we'll see that Huntsman's Minion removed. 
With the beast now out of the equation, it states at the bottom of the Insight mission, slay this minion and reveal card 37. I've also gone ahead and give myself a Blood Echo, which brings me up to my maximum of three. Technically, I still have a card in hand and could interact with that consumable there if I want to, but let's reveal the card and see what happens first. Last minute rescue. Checking over the hunter, he still lives, but only barely. He is not a hunter of the dream, however. If he is to survive, we must get him somewhere safe. Place one survivor token on the Great Bridge space. Any hunter may pick up the token when they move out of that space. It respawns to the Great Bridge. If the hunter teleports or goes to the dream, complete this mission when the hunter ends a move on a particular clinic tile with the token, then you'd reveal card 38, or if the hunter ends a move on a particular chapel tile with the token, reveal card 39. Now the timing of this is really interesting because where I'm at on the hunt track right now is two spaces away from the next reset, which is not great because once all the enemies come back out on the game board, I'm not really sitting in a great place health-wise to deal with this situation. And there was really a couple things I could have done here. You also notice I removed the fog gates. I could have used that dodge card I had in hand to heal one, but it makes more sense to do what I did, which is to hold on to it. I could either use it right now to go after the consumable that's there, or better yet, I could use it to go to the hunter's dream and actually get myself back up to full health, plus be able to cash in all those blood echoes before I potentially lose them, which would be really bad because I got the maximum I can get right now. So maybe before going any further, I should do that. By actually going to the hunter's dream, it'll tick the track up by one. And then when we come back and we start our next turn, it'll tick it up again and then we'll have a fresh number of rounds without any resets being involved before we have to deal with that again, which should give me enough time to hopefully get the survivor and get out of there. Although the closest lantern to come back in on is the central lamp, which is to the left and off screen. So I need to work my way back over to the Great Bridge again, which I'm not necessarily looking forward to. As tempting as it is to maybe even run out of the tile and just start heading towards the graveyard to maybe go north or south to try to find this particular tile or one of the tiles that I need to find in order to progress the Insight mission, I think it just makes more sense to do what I did just now, which is discard the card I had in hand to go back to the Hunter's Dream and get ready and more prepared for what's coming. Back at the Hunter's Dream, the very first thing we're going to do, tick down that hunt track, we're going to take three Blood Echoes and we're going to purchase some brand new upgrades. Some very tough decisions here, to be honest. There's quite a few cards here that I actually want, but I'm gonna do them one at a time, because again, you can always purchase a card, it's immediately replenished, you can see what comes up next, and maybe that will change your decision. But I'm gonna go with Swift for now, because I really wanna upgrade one of those basic plus one damage cards to be a little bit quicker. Interesting, another invigorating one. That one, ah, oh, it's so tempting because of that heal. That heal's really nice. Being able to dodge and clear any slot, like that's honestly a really good card. I think I'm gonna go ahead and grab that one because I do still have a basic dodge in my hand, so maybe I will. And 100% I'm taking this next one called Rallying. It has another heal on it. It's a plus one damage, but after the attack, you get to heal too. That will be very, very handy. So with the final Blood Echo there to the left of my Hunter, we'll purchase that and replenish. As you can see, the cards that are coming through this deck, each one is very unique and throws a lot of interesting little strategies in there that you can use or employ as you build out your character. You can see here, Dash is a dodge card that allows you to clear the slot, but when used for movement, allows you to move three spaces. I mean, things like that can really help. Now, just so you can get an idea as to what's going out of my deck in order to bring these cards into my deck, because it's my choice to do so right now, I'm going to go ahead and bring all three of them in, getting rid of a bunch of basic cards. So everything that's underneath of one of those top cards are the ones that are being discarded from the deck. My deck has been replaced. We're also going to bump ourselves back up to 6 HP. The Hunter Pistol is going to be refreshed. We're going to decide whether we want to actually keep the Trick Weapon on this side or not. Potentially move the Bloodstone Shard as well. We won't wait until we actually get back on the board to do that decision. And then the Ruin on the far right hand side is going to become refreshed and available again. All right, I've preemptively gone ahead and set my trick weapon. Again, the official time to do this is when you actually place your character back on the map. But in my case, I'm gonna do this because I believe this is how I want it set. Knowing that things are going to reset on the board, I'm gonna need to take out some big beasts. I wanna get ready with some big time hits. 
My hunters arrived back on the game board at the central lamp. I do have the tomb lamp way further left, but we've covered that area of the board. There's also a hunter mob back there. I'm not really going to go back there right now. My focus is to get back to the survivor and try to get that survivor. But as we enter into the tile right now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to be ticking up the hunt track, which is going to then trigger a complete reset of everything here going on. Plus, we need to draw up some cards for our turn. All right, let's work our way through this. I've gone ahead and drawn up three cards. We're definitely heading right into where that Scourge Beast is. We're going to try and take it out right away. Discarding a card gets me two spaces into the space of the Scourge Beast. Now we're going to initiate an attack. I'm going to end up using probably my basic draw one card in the heavy carve slot, which is my four damage attack. And this works out really well because four damage is enough to wipe this thing out. It's moving at a slow pace in terms of the attack, but I do still have the dodge available, which could also clear a slot. So I could choose to try and clear the giant heavy carve slot in order to ready myself for the next attack I want to do very soon, soon in the future. So for now, let's go ahead and grab an enemy action and see what happens. We also certainly don't want to forget about drawing a card for placing that basic draw one. I got Cheap Shot. This is a great card. Allows me to do some damage from my hand. The Scourge Beast, however, is doing a special attack. It's a pin and gnaw. This is a really nasty one, to be honest. It's a slow moving attack, but it has stun, which means I'd have to discard a card to avoid an additional damage. And it also states cannot be dodged. So the dodge step that I have available to me normally right now, well, it's not available to me right now. So we have a simultaneous attack happening and resolving right now. So basically four damage coming to me, which is pretty brutal. And then on the opposite side, four damage going to it, wiping it out. But I do get to draw a card and heal one thanks to my trick weapon ability. All right, that was a bit rough, but we did get some great card draws in there and a little bit of healing, plus a Blood Echo for taking this thing out, and we could just continue our turn forward, although I'm a little concerned about going up against the Hunter Mob with just 3 HP. Now, one thing I didn't resolve that I need to resolve prior to drawing the card for the reward of taking out the enemy, which was the Counter-Strike one right here, I have to pick if I want to discard one of the two cards in my hand to avoid the stun damage. So, do I want to do this? Ah, it's tough. It really is, because I'm honestly looking at two different cards that I could use, and I could honestly use the Invigorating Heal 1 for sure, so maybe the Cheap Shot has to go this time just to avoid that damage hit. So what I'm going to do is prepare myself to go up against the Hunter's Mob for the next turn. We're all squared away right now, but based on the cards I have right now, I just don't like jumping in there. It's not going to work out based on the cards I can play in my slots. And the one slot I want to use to wipe this thing out really fast is already clogged up. And thanks to the Scourge Beast special that didn't allow me to dodge, I wasn't able to clear any other slot, meaning I could clear that uh, heavy carve slot I love so much for those big enemies. So what I'm going to do is actually going to burn the counter strike card in order to pick up the consumable that's there and hope there's something there that could help me going up against the hunter mob or anything else in the future we ended up finding some numbing mist it says on attack enemies attack loses all effects now that could be really handy because some effects off of some of the enemies different abilities whether it's basic special or their actual ability are really nasty what I really like about this game so far is that you can have a strategy and within seconds of an enemy attack or just based on the cards you're using in hand, your strategy is constantly changing. So maybe instead of focusing on going after the Hunter's Mob right now, I can focus on trying to find one of the location tiles that I actually need to get. Seeing as I have a card in hand that I really can't use and I'd just be kind of holding on to for another turn in the future. I don't have any enemies that are going to really be on top of me when I end my turn anyway. So maybe it's worth taking a look at the next tile. This is where it gets sketchy because if I'm moving one north let's say and then one I have to I have to go ahead and move at least one into the tile I've revealed depending on what's there I would have zero cars to defend against it but I do really want to try and see how far away I'm going to have to go with the survivor that's over there at the uh, bridge in order to complete the insight mission because that is one of the major pieces of the hunt mission I'm trying to complete that was absolutely worth it we found the clinic it states on the clinic tile, once during their turn, the hunter may suffer one damage to draw one card. That's pretty cool. We're going to stop right there for my turn. I have no more cards in hand, so we're going to go ahead and bump up the hunt track by one, and we're going to draw up three new cards. 
All right, I'm kind of in a sticky situation here because of how many cards I have, how far away that particular space is I need to get to with the survivor. You'll see I have to burn two cards just to move enough spaces to get there. So it's nice I found the clinic, but I put myself too far away now. So once I get to the space with the hunter mob, I'll only have one card, which means I'm pretty much just attacking and hoping I don't get slaughtered because I only have three health. But the one thing I have in my back pocket is I know based on the deck currently, a special and a basic has been pulled. So there's a chance still that we could see basic attacks coming from the uh, hunter mob first and if that happens I can use my hunter pistol pistol to stagger it now this is going to be a very much a uh, fluky situation if I can land that particular card off the top of the deck uh, but what I'm going to do is give it a shot because I don't think I have any other choice being that I'm low on health and I really need to make sure I use the window I have right now on the hunt track to the best of my ability because I have three spaces and I'm already one space in that are clear and free of any resets before we get into the very end tail end of that hunt track where things get crunched down to just two safe spaces in between and then the game comes to a close. So I really need to make some progress quick. So I'm going to do something rash here and we're going to just run straight in there. This is super risky and I really hope it pays off or it's going to come back to bite me. But basically I have one card here unyielding. I'm going to use this card in order to start the attack because at least I get to draw one and I get a stagger out of it. Unyielding has gone into the middle slot for a medium attack slash damage of two. It has stagger, draw one. I just drew up the card tireless. Not a card that I really want to see right now. I uh, would have liked to have seen a dodge or something else, but that's not going to work out. So that's the card I have in hand, but now we have to find out what the enemy action is going to be, and I'm a little bit scared. Yes, it was a basic. That's awesome. Okay, so that was definitely worth it. That was extremely fluky, though, because there were a couple cards in there that could have thrown that sideways. I'm using my Hunter Pistol right now to go ahead and stagger the enemy. Now, it's worth mentioning, I technically have a stagger right now, but remember, the stagger that I have right now is at a medium speed, and the basic attack that the Hunter Mob does is a medium speed. In order for stagger to be successful, you can only stagger things that are slower speeds than you so the stagger on my unyielding card would have done nothing to prevent a basic attack from happening although the good news is the basic axe swing wouldn't have killed me anyway but I really don't want to deplete any more health off me so having this card come up was perfect because I can use the hunter pistol to just completely disregard all right, so two damage on the enemy, and I have a choice now. I still have the tireless card down below here. I could use it to potentially spur on another attack here and hope to kill it. Probably should try to do that. And you know what? This is going to be perfect. By putting Tireless in the quick cut position at a fast speed of three, I'm now going to go ahead and instead of drawing two and discarding a card and being able to remove any conditions, I'm going to use the rune that I have that was refreshed when I went to the Hunter's Dream. You remember that one. On attack, replace your stack card's effect with a plus one damage and stagger. Now that is more like it, and we've got enough damage coming through with this, plus the stagger at a speed of three, which is faster than every single attack coming from the Hunter mob. So as you can see here for the Hunter's mob, everything's moving at either a medium speed or a slow speed, including the ability. And remember, certain abilities always, if they do not indicate a speed, are happening instantaneously right away before anything else. But if it does indicate a speed, like this one does, where it is slow, then my fast attack is going to happen quicker than that ability. So I'm safe in all regards here, no matter what comes up from the deck. And it ended up being a basic anyway. It was actually a two speed or medium attack, which is dangerous, but not fast enough than my quick cut attack, which does two damage and the stagger will stop the enemy's attack whatsoever from actually happening. And it doesn't matter anyway, because the two damage I put on this thing is going to wipe it out. I feel a lot better now about risking it, going and checking out and finding another tile, ended up being a clinic, and then actually just saying, the heck with it, let's just run in there and see what happens. It worked out. After defeating the uh, Hunter mob, we also get a Blood Echo, and we're going to get to draw a card and heal one. So we're back up to four health now. We have two Blood Echoes. We got a Swift card drawn. It's worth mentioning, things may seem like it's smooth sailing and I've been doing decent through here, but you got to remember, time is your enemy in this game. And if you take a look at the Hunt Track, which you can't see off screen right now, I am in the final back half of the Hunt Track at this point and actually a little bit past half at this point. So 
I'm getting to a point here where if I don't get some insight to progress the hunt mission, seeing as I need two insight missions completed, I'm going to be in a very stressful position at the very end of this. So with that all said, let's go ahead and spend that last card that I just drew up. We're going to use it for movement. Myself and the survivor are going to make our way towards the clinic. That's going to round out my turn. There's no enemies within one tile of me all around, so that's a huge plus. And we still have a couple of turns here to go before we have a reset, but right now we're starting a brand new turn. I'll go ahead and show you where we're at in the hunt track, and we'll be up to it by one and then drawing up three cards. See what I was saying about that hunt track? It's getting a little bit close to the end here, and we're moving it up by one right now. Now let's go ahead, draw up three cards, and try and get this insight mission completed. Isn't it the worst when you draw up a hand and you just wish there were creatures around you could just slay? That is a fantastic draw. I don't think I've ever had that kind of draw so far where I have so much beefing up of damage as well as healing, drawing one, healing one, dodging with healing. Like, this just makes me cry inside. There's nothing around here to take out. I mean, I could run all the way over to the uh, uh, hunter mob way left, but that's just a waste of our time. Let's go ahead and unfortunately burn one of these cards. And actually, we're going to need to potentially... Well, we just need to burn one, I believe, just to get into the clinic tile itself. I believe if we end in movement there, and I'll check on the insight mission to be sure of that, just one card should be enough to trigger the next step in this. And yes, after checking the card, you just have to be on the clinic tile, not necessarily the back space of the tile, in order to go ahead and reveal the card. Well, it's good news. We completed an insight mission here. It says, surviving the hunt, distribute the old hunter's bone reward and the repeating pistol firearm among the hunters. I like the sounds of that. So how do we get these items? Well, it states here, as you approach the clinic, Yosefka instructs you to lay the wounded hunter near the door, then leave. She will handle it from here. Before departing, the weakened hunter reaches for you, motioning for you to take his equipment. Check out these additions. We got ourselves a repeating pistol. When an enemy makes a basic attack, automatically stagger that enemy. Now this is the exact same text that's on my hunter pistol, but there's a difference. And I'll show you in a second when we flip it over in terms of when it's exhausted. On the right there, we have the old hunter bone. When you are attacked, automatically dodge that attack. That also sounds extremely timely and definitely something I probably want to hold on to. Now this is where the repeating pistol actually has a difference in terms of the hunter pistol that I already have. It states down below, on the hunter turn, discard one card to refresh. That's normal for the hunter pistol, but this is an addition or for free when you transform your weapon. I like that. Now I just want to summarize what I did here. You'll see the repeating pistol is absolutely in my slot right now. Exchanged out for the hunter pistol. Now if you ever want to switch your guns beyond gaining one as a reward like I did just now, you have to wait in between chapters to do so. But as soon as you gain it as a reward, you can instantly equip it if you want to. And I definitely do. So that hunter pistol kind of away stowed in my inventory. I've also placed the surviving of the hunt insight mission. We've got one of them. We need one more to progress the hunt mission. I also do decide to take the old hunter bone because I think it's going to come in way more handy way more often than my hand lantern even though the hand lantern is really handy for bouncing around and going from one lantern to another and teleporting around I just didn't use it enough yet to justify it however I'm sure there's certain scenarios where that's going to come in handy and I might regret getting rid of it but those are my choices for now now, this was a miss on my part because of my extreme focus on that other insight mission. I didn't realize earlier when I actually found the clinic that I was supposed to go ahead and reveal card 24 back when I stumbled into it. And then we decided to run away and go after the hunter's mob. So we'll go ahead and reveal it now. No major gameplay impact except for the fact that I should have had the knowledge of what that other insight mission was earlier. Iosefska's research. A soft voice addresses you. A hunter? I'm terribly sorry, but... You may not enter. I am a Sefka. This is my clinic, and I cannot allow any chance of infection within. But I might be able to aid you. I am working on a cure for this terrible plague, but I require blood samples from those freshly infected. Will you assist me? It says here to slay a hunter mob or huntsman's minion while it is on Yosefka's clinic tiles. Oh, wow. So I have to actually bring or drag someone over here and then take it down. 
Now that is a very tricky insight mission because even if I had to reveal this when I when I actually moved in the tile originally and I went over to the Great Bridge and I tried to move that hunts, uh, hunter mob over to the clinic, it would have taken them, especially with them moving just one every single time at the end of my turn, it would have taken me four turns just to get them into the clinic to attack them and by then the track would pretty much be at the very end and well there's likely no chance we would actually be able to win this thing and especially now with the fact this other hunter mob is even further away down to the left that doesn't bode well for me so i might need to go seek out the chapel and hope the chapel has a insight mission that's a little bit more timely a little bit quicker to resolve but things are getting stressful already so with the two cards that I have, even though they're fantastic, I might burn both of them just to move all the way south and reveal the tile that's below the graveyard. Am I terrified as to what I might walk into with zero cards in hand? Yes. Big regrets. Big time regrets. Yes, this just went south really, really fast. I did not expect to go into a tile to have two enemies show up there. I was thinking, ah, eh, one would be bad. Two is a lot worse, and especially in this situation where I have no cards, I do still have my repeating pistol, I do still have the ability to do a dodge, I do still have my numbing mist, so I have a few thing tricks up my sleeve, I might be able to survive this, but uh, yeah, this is going to be tough. But my turn is over right now anyway, and now we're going to switch over to activating the enemies within one tile of me, and we're going to start left to right across the board of the different enemies, so that's going to start with the Huntsman's Minion, which is literally in the spot I'm in right now. Let's go ahead and pull a card up and do a little crying. A uh, special attack. All right, that's going to be fun. Okay, so what does it say here? Overhead slam, slow attack, four damage, cannot be staggered, deals two damage to all other hunters in the space unless they dodge it. Well then, okay, so in my uh, case, I'm definitely going to dodge this. So I'm going to use that old hunter bone that I just got to completely flip it and stop this entire attack from happening. The hunter mob that was adjacent to me has now moved into my space, so I have more joining the party on the tile, and I pulled the ability card, the last card in the deck at the very bottom. It says, at a slow speed, so this one won't be, re uh, you know, instantly resolved, but uh, it probably will be, unless, of course, I can do something about it. But at a slow speed, before the hunters attack, move the hunter mob one space away. All hunters in this space, uh, it left, must then dodge or suffer three damage. This is bad. Now you may think that I'd be able to use the numbing miss, which says on attack, enemies attack loses all effects, which is exactly the kind of thing I want to see right now. But the keywords on attack in the glossary at the back of the rule book states, these effects trigger when the player selects an attack slot before attacks are resolved. So in other words, I have to initiate an attack to then use Numbing Mist as part of it to get rid of the effects. So I can't just use it when I'm the one just getting straight up attacked. So in this situation, I'm not going to be able to use this, which is really unfortunate for me. So the Hunter Mob is in my space right now, but based on its ability is going to go ahead and step back one. Throw a lovely Molotov, which I could have dodged if I had the old Hunter Bone, but I don't. So in this particular case, I'm taking three damage, which doesn't kill me, but puts me extremely close to death. All right, the enemy action deck has been reshuffled back together. We're gonna to be moving the Hunt Track up by one. I still have no idea whatsoever how I survived that, but I can tell you right now, being right up against the next reset, I'm just going to probably be running at this point to get away from these things. Here's what I have for cards, and I'm going to have to choose one to discard in order to get some movement to get off this tile. I'm probably going to be going ahead and heading west. Look what we found here. Now, this is one of the places we needed to find to trigger an insight mission. But first, before we do so, we're going to go ahead and trigger pursuing, which is going to have both of these creatures move one space towards me. Yeah, and it's not really just two creatures. It's actually a whole hunter mob and on top of it, a huntsman's minion right there at the chapel. My fingers are crossed that when I go ahead and pull a card 29 for ending a movement in the chapel, we're going to see some fog gates because if we don't, I am going to be in some serious trouble. 
As you approach the old chapel, the smell of warding incense fills your nose. You cautiously press on the large wooden doors. If you have Moment of Mercy, reveal card 30. Well, that sounds pretty useful. Probably something I probably needed to get in here without getting destroyed. Oh, this is going to be bad. And then otherwise, reveal card 33. Well, we're going down the south path here. From the darkened corner of the chapel, a hunched and robed figure addresses you. Ah, a hunter, are ya? Good, good, I've been waiting for one of your ilk. If you spot anyone with their wits about them, bring them to the, ear, the chapel. They'll be safe here. Hunters also gain one survivor token when they pick up consumables from a treasure or, yes, yeah, a treasure space. These tokens are lost if the hunter teleports or goes to the dream. Hunters ending a move on the chapel tile place their held tokens on this card. Complete this mission when you've got, I guess in my case, one plus one tokens have been placed in this card. So I'm gonna have to get two tokens back to this particular space in order to reveal cards 34 so no fog gates <laughs> that's not going to be saving me anytime soon so i gotta think about moving even further and maybe faster or going to the hunter's dream because everything's going to reset anyway and i'll be in a nightmare scenario all right, so long story short, it's all about consumables right now, but I need to pick up a consumable that will then give me a survivor token. And then once I get those tokens, those two survivor tokens back to the chapel, then I can go ahead and reveal card 34. So the spots that I'm eyeing is at the graveyard location and then the one consumable you can see right there with the hunter mob. They're both on either side of the central lamp tile. Those are probably the two I should go after. And knowing full well that a reset is coming up on the next turn everything on this game board will go back to where they were so the monsters that are chasing me will go elsewhere and kind of be hopefully out of my way i want to say but at this point in time it might make more sense for me honestly to just go back to the hunter's dream although that terrifies me because we're getting very close to the end of this and you know what? I'm kind of forced into it. With only one health, the chances of me using a whole bunch of cards and working my way all the way over to one of those mobs to try and take out and get a consumable, like it just doesn't make any sense at all. I'll be burning time. I won't be getting myself reset and ready to go. So I'm going to go back to the Hunter's Dream right now. I just went ahead and discarded Cheap Shot. So my Hunter will go there. We can upgrade because I have two Blood Echoes and then reset everything, including my health, get my weapons all set up, and then come right back to the Central Lamp Tile. And hopefully with the time remaining, be able to complete this insight mission and then pray that this is all we need for the hunt mission or we're in trouble. Back at the Hunter's Dream, we'll go ahead and tick up the hunt track, which will hit a reset point. The entire board is gonna be reset. There's about to be a lot of friends joining us on the game board. Game board's been dealt with. Now let's go ahead and spend some blood echoes and get some upgrades. Based on what I'm trying to accomplish right now, obviously Dash is the one I wanna pick up. Finally, I'm going to grab Adaptive, the one on the end there that has a dodge, a stagger, and the ability to clear the slot as well. Second win states, when used for non-attack actions, heal two. That is really good, but we have no more Blood Echoes to spend. In order to get the cards that I just picked up from the Hunter's Dream, I'm discarding some basic cards down below. Remember, whenever you're discarding cards out of your deck in order to make room, they don't have to match for color. You can do whatever you want. Here's what my Hunter dashboard as well as the cards around it look like. Things have been refreshed, got my health all the way back up, and of course my trick weapon I can decide what I want to do, but honestly I'll probably keep it on this side just for that draw one heal one because I'm going to be pushing really hard to get these consumables, which is going to put me in some dangerous paths of enemies. So let's go ahead and pull some cards and also bump up the hunt track by one. As you can see in the lower left hand corner there, things are coming down to the wire and we've got three cards here pulled up in front of us. We've got Adaptive, Tireless, and Bloodthirsty. I am on a mission to go left and right to grab both of those consumables as fast as possible. I'm gonna go ahead and discard Tireless in order to move two spaces to the left. We're gonna head west in order to deal with the uh, Hunter Mob first because if I go over to the Scourge Beast on the right, I'll be within one tile of all those other enemies that are connected, which means all of them will start moving towards me and I don't want that happening too early. I'd rather that happening at the very tail end when I'm trying to pull this off at the last gong. So let's go left, deal with the Hunter Mob, and then come back and see how this pans out. 
All right, let's slot a card in for our attack into the Hunter dashboard. Now I've gone ahead and moved my Stone Shard, and why can I do this? Because you draw your cards up first, and then you can go ahead and select which side of your trick weapon you want it to be on once you then put your miniature into play. So I haven't had to do this yet, but knowing all the enemies and where they're at based on the reset, I really want to make sure that Shard's in the right spot, and I do get to know what cards are in my hand before I figure out which side my trick weapon is on, which means I can then figure out which which slot the bloodstone shard should be in and i want to put it there because i want to use bloodthirsty which will already tick me up to four damage in my slow moving heavy carve attack the bonus of this too is i'll be able to draw one up as well as heal if i can swing this the Hunter Mob got its special, which is really bad. It's also a slow moving attack. It does four damage and has stun. Let's see if I can stop this. I can have an opportunity here to dodge if I'd like to, which I probably will. Now I'd really like to hold on to the card that I have in hand here in order to try and pick up the consumable as well as the survivor to start making progress on the inside mission. So using that for a dodge right now, probably not the best idea. So what I might actually do is maybe use the old Hunter Bone in this case. That's exactly what I'll do. I flipped it over and exhausted it, so we've dodged the attack. All four of my damage goes through. We get to draw up a card. The Hunter Mob was completely wiped out, gained a Blood Echo, drew up a card. We got ourselves Dash with the dodge. It allows us to move some spaces. That's perfect. Now we are in a space with a consumable. I'm going to use Adaptive to open it up, grab a survivor, and whatever's in that crate. No way, this is awesome! I, you guys are not going to believe me, but I literally just pulled the top card off the consumable deck. Blue Elixir, move two. Another card that can help me with movement, which I'm going to make use of. I really don't want to be wasting time right now. I'm going to decide to stay put. Strategically, it makes a lot of sense to do this. And the first thing I want to mention, too, is a survivor token that I got for getting that consumable has been placed above my hunter dashboard. That's coming from the insight mission text that says every time I get a consumable, I get a survivor. I need two of those tokens back to the uh, chapel in order to progress that mission, get the second insight, which will allow me to progress the overall hunt mission. So what I'm thinking right now is if I move my hunter into the central lamp tile, the bad news about that is a scourge beast, which is right to the east of it, is going to activate it's because it's within one tile on its turn and it's going to move up to two spaces it'll be right on top of me attacking me i don't want that because i don't want to go back to the hunter's dream early that will waste time and not be good for me so i'm going to sit put i'm going to keep this awesome dash card i have in my hand for my next turn and we're going to go ahead and activate any enemies there's none within any tiles of me so we're going to uptick the hunter's track by one putting us right close to the very very last position so as you can see down in the bottom left, the track is getting to the tail end. I've drawn up two cards, got Invigorating and Swift. These should hopefully help me out. Now I gotta decide how do I move and what do I use to do it. First thing I'm gonna do is use my blue elixir to move the hunter to the central lamp center space. Next, I'm going to get rid of one of my dodge cards in order to move another two spaces right in there with the Scourge Beast. And we're going to initiate an attack with the Swift card that's going to end up going in the slash position on my trick weapon, which is a medium speed, two damage, plus the one for the Stone Shard, plus the one for Swift, which will be four, which is exactly what we need to take this thing down. And then we'll draw a card and see how things go. So this is how we're looking right now. We got the Swift card in that center position there. So four total damage from that attack if it can actually happen. We're going to go ahead and draw from the enemy action deck right now. And I do still have a dodge in hand, but I'm trying to hold on to that card to potentially use it for moving three spaces. If I can kill this thing quicker, then it can attack me or I could maybe use my repeating pistol to avoid anything or whatever I got. Uh, the positive is that dash gives me three movement to get from the graveyard to the chapel in one card use. Use, which is why I'm holding on to it. The Scourge Beast ended up getting a basic attack, which I'm going to use my repeating pistol right now in order to stagger that enemy. The other reason I'm doing that on my end is, as you can see, I'm using a slash, the center medium speed, plus one for swift, which is three, which is great because it meets the exact same speed as the enemy, but I don't want to resolve the enemy's attack against me. I'd rather just cleanly disregard it. So I'm just going to go ahead and use that repeating pistol. It's already been exhausted. So that attack from the enemy does nothing. And then my attack goes through and it's a slash for two plus the bloodstone shard of one plus the swift is another one that's four damage wiping that thing off the map i guess the only comical thing in all of this is i didn't think about the fact i need a card in order to open up the consumable but guess what when i kill something i get to draw a card and heal one don't need the heal but i'll definitely take that draw one 
I ended up with Counter Strike. It's a dodge after dodging deal two damage to the enemy. Well, I'm just gonna use that card right now to get that consumable in my space. Pretty happy about this consumable. It is the Quicksilver Bullets. On the Hunter's turn, refresh your firearm. Well, it's my turn right now. I'm gonna use that to literally refresh it. I wanna be ready for anything that this game's gonna throw at me. Now we're gonna go ahead and use my dash card, which I've been holding on to. It says, when used, moved up to three spaces, getting me right inside the chapel. As it mentions on the card, we brought our survivors back to the chapel. So it says, complete this mission when you've got two tokens, in my case, have been placed on these cards, reveal card 34. Well, we're gonna go ahead and do that right now. Interesting, so you'll see here it mentions the shelter at the clinic. The insight mission for that may no longer be completed. So there was actually another insight mission that we never even got to even interact with that basically ended off. It states here, distribute the, oh nice, we get a rune here, that's awesome. I'm gonna go gra gather that reward, we'll see what it looks like. Now again, remember with these runes, you can only have two on a hunter at maximum. So we have to decide whether we wanna toss one of the ones we already have or just let this one go away. Now the two that I have right now says when you are slain you get to keep one blood echo which I really like so at least you're not going into the hunter's dream completely with nothing in terms of being able to purchase something so I like that one and the other one is the on attack one that allows you to give a plus one damage and stagger and I've used that a couple times already I don't think I'll use this one as much so I think I'm going to let this one go. And with another insight mission in the bag, let's go to the hunt mission, which states when the hunters have collected at least two insight, this chapter reveal card 20. From deep in the district, a piercing screech rings in the night air. This is not the familiar roar of a scourge beast. With a loud crash, a monstrous figure lands upon our corpse-laden trap. Surround the graveyard tile with fog gates, spawn the cleric beast on a, oh wow, okay. We're spawning that on its, uh, actually that's not gonna work. Oh, I actually remember this from the FAQ. The cleric beast is not going to spawn on the symbol it shows uh, actually right there, it's gonna spawn on the consumable icon, not on the lantern icon, as there's no lantern icon on the graveyard. It respawns to this space on a reset, and then when the cleric beast enters phase two, reveal cards 21 and 22. Well, this, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pull this off now in time. As you can see on the graveyard tile there in the middle, there is no lantern space whatsoever. So it is the consumable space that the cleric beast is gonna enter on along with all the fog gates showing up. No big deal, this guy's pretty small, he's not gonna be a problem at all. Obviously I can take him on in one single round. And that honestly is the problem. I only have a single round left as my turn is officially over. I have nothing else cards wise I can use. So at this point, we're gonna bump the hunt track up, which is gonna hit a reset space. This is gonna be the final round of the game. There is no way I'm gonna be able to take this thing out as it still has phases you need to go through for these big time bosses. Plus everything spawning back on the map and resetting. Just so all of you can see, the card that comes out for the Cleric Beast on the right there is the Phase 1 card. And of course, based on the number of Hunters, you'll have a certain amount of health you're going to have to take out in order to move past that phase. Then this card will flip over to the Phase 2 side. Don't worry, we will not be seeing that Phase 2 side as I will not be able to put as much damage on this thing. Being that I have one Hunter, I need 10 damage to get past Phase 1. You'll see on the left, for each one of these major bosses here, you're going to have a Phase 1 deck and a Phase 2 deck. And of course, going to be drawing cards from them when they activate based on which phase you're in. Drawing up three cards to start my turn, I got myself Unyielding, Invigorating, and a basic draw one. What's a little brutal about my current position is that not only do I only have one round left or one turn left basically to play here, also my trick weapon currently is very filled up. Most of the best attacks in terms of damage are already populated, so I'd have to do some refreshing of my trick weapon, which of course is gonna have me spend a card. Plus, I need to actually get into the space with the fog gates with this enemy, this cleric beast, in order to even start hitting it. So by the time I get in there I'm probably not gonna have many cards to do much damage. I've chosen to go ahead and discard my dodge card because while I don't need the heal from it and these other draw one cards are likely more helpful to me to get more cards to allow me to do more on my turn so we're gonna go ahead and move two spaces. And in order to even get in there and do any damage I'm gonna have to discard another card just to move that one point to get next to the cleric beast. 
Now that I'm in the same space, I'm gonna use my last card. And of course, I mentioned that I could have used one of these cards in order to uh, change my trick weapon over, but just again, based on how many cards I needed to get in there, things didn't pan out in that regard. So I'll be placing Unyielding in the quick cut position, which is the only one available. I've placed Unyielding in the quick cut position for one damage at a three speed or fast speed. It also has stagger draw one. So I drew up a card, I got cheap shot. It has stagger on it. It states if an enemy uses a uh, ability, uh, then you can discard this from hand to deal them two damage. This time around, and it will likely be the only time, as we only have one more round here to play, we're gonna see a card come off the phase one Cleric Beast deck to find out what is coming my way. The card states Grab. It's a fast attack for three damage. It has Stagger. It says the Hunter may exhaust their firearm to place one inside token on the Cleric Beast card. This attack deals negative one damage per inside token on the Cleric Beast. So you can see that phase deck is gonna change things up by just throwing a straight damaged attack at you in some way, shape, or form, and it's not gonna be tied to a basic special or ability card. So that's worth noting. You're not gonna see a lot of it in this playthrough because we're only gonna be playing through this round, but at least you got to see one of them. Don't worry, if you're picking the game up, you will see a lot of them, and they will throw a lot of wrenches into your plans, a lot of nasty attacks. So first off, they both have stagger. My attack as well as the Cleric Beast's attack, neither are gonna apply because we're both moving at a fast speed. And you can see from that phase one card, it gives you a different way to use your firearm because remember the firearm is specific, especially what I have right here, to getting a basic attack from the enemy, which isn't gonna happen when you're drawing from the phase deck. So in this case, now I can use this firearm in order to place an insight token on the cleric beast in order to reduce how badly this thing's gonna hit me. There we go, I place an inside token next to the Cleric Beast. You can also place it on the card too if you want to, or somewhere near the phase one card, just for reference. I'll put it on the game board. But in this case, it's gonna be a pretty easy resolve here. I'm doing one damage, so basically the Cleric Beast will take one hit, and then I'm gonna take two damage as the inside token removes one of the three that would have initially hit me. So as you can see, these attacks coming from the major bosses are pretty nasty, they're pretty aggressive, and they're gonna whittle your health down real fast. So when you go into these attacks, not only you're gonna need time to be able to take them down, you're gonna need to be able to make sure you've got yourself set up to do some big time heavy attacks. Now, I had not set myself up in this way because I had run out of time and used a lot of my attacks to clear out and get an insight mission at the very tail end of this play, but if I had have had more time or used my time more wisely, which definitely can happen, there's many different strategies around that as well and I'll leave those for you to find but I could have used my heavy card for my slash would have put a lot of extra damage onto this thing maybe moving me past phase one pretty quickly but then moving into phase two I would have had to probably revert my trick weapon to the opposite side and start pounding away at its health. And also, unfortunately, I can't use Cheap Shot because the enemy's not drawing from the enemy action deck and it's not stated that it's an ability, so because it's not, I can't just do a Cheap Shot on this thing. Because, well, it's a gigantic monster, it's a gigantic boss, it's not that easy. You can Cheap Shot these smaller enemies, but this one, not so much. So, that's gonna do it. I have no more cards, that really ends it, and at this point, basically, the enemy is going to activate again, so technically, you do get to see another activation of Pain coming my way. Oh no, and this one's really bad. It's an overhead slam for four damage, targets all hunters in the space. Before this attack, one hunter in the space may exhaust their firearm to place one inside token on the Cleric Beast card. This attack then deals negative amount of damage. Well, it's actually really funny. So because I was able to at least use my firearm once and place one inside token already, this four damage attack will turn into a three. I don't have the ability to go ahead and do what it's asking, which is obviously a exhaust my firearm again at this point. So I actually saved myself from dying and going to the hunter's dream, but I'm down to just a single health. And just like that, that's going to end the playthrough for Bloodborne, the board game. Now, technically, I'm not knocked over, taken out just yet. I've knocked my mini over because, well, it was inevitable. I was going to be taken out during this battle for sure. Was not as prepared as I needed to be to get in here and defeat this boss. And we'll be running again to take this thing out off camera. So I want to throw it out to you guys. Was this showcase helpful, breaking down some barriers of Bloodborne to help you get this game to the table and enjoy it? I can tell you right now, 
for myself personally. This is one that's gonna come back to the table multiple times. Definitely happy I picked up everything in the Kickstarter, mainly because it's gonna really add to the variety within the game. There's also, it's worth mentioning for people that want an increased challenge, you can bring things in like a, an, uh, an actual campaign at the end of the Hunter's Dream, as well as another expansion, I believe, that adds another chapter to how long your campaign can be. Plus, you can also add in mini bosses and other different changes to the gameplay to throw in some spice beyond just the regular minions and of course the nasty beast. You've got something in the middle there as a mini boss that can throw some wrenches into your plan, just adding more layers to the game. I really like the strategic card play of what goes on here and I find there's a lot of decision making and a lot of efficiency in terms of how you play your turns. That These are some of the things I love the most about this game. And being that it's a miniatures game, you'd assume this game would just be full of dice and a lot of just random chance, but the card play really removes a majority of that. I think overall the only swingy part of the game that really can get you when you're not paying attention is the enemy action deck in its early stages when the deck has been reshuffled and you're not 100% certain what's going to come up but you know the odds because you know the breakdown of the six cards inside the deck. You just don't know which card's going to technically come up. That might throw off your first few attacks but as the cards come out you're able to start to look at them and go okay well those three are on the table so the chances of getting X card are that much higher or lower meaning I can adjust my strategy to mitigate bad things happening. So you do have opportunities and windows of time to make the best use of your cards. And that's where the fun of this game comes in is managing all of that, picking your windows and also not fighting everything that you see. Don't by default, especially in these miniature based games, think that whatever enemies on the game board is worth slaughtering. That's not the mindset of Bloodborne. Sometimes you're going to need to avoid and just run away. Now the majority of you know this, of course this game is based off the extremely popular video game and I think personally the design choices around this one and how they implemented everything here is as close to what you'd expect or want and even maybe more so than what you'd expect and want out of a tabletop adaption of a video game. These kind of conversions can be very tough sometimes and they don't always move and transition well to the tabletop so when one really does break through and do does a fantastic fantastic job of not only bringing that game experience to the tabletop but then also making it unique enough that is different than anything else out there I really really appreciate and like that and this will be an example of one of those conversions from video game to tabletop that I'll point to as a great example of how it should be done Lastly, I want to thank everybody for watching. This was an extra long one. Of course, I survived chapter number one, got into chapter two, and literally almost got through chapter two, but just ran out of time. The next chapter after this would have been chapter three, and we would have completed things at that point. It was a lot of fun to go through this with you guys. Really hope you enjoyed the showcase. Thank you guys for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo.